are you the quantum mechanics? Yes, we are the quantum mechanics, the paranormal podcast for the believers, the doubters and everybody in between. This week, I'd like to start with a special hello to everybody who is in their baths. We did <laughs> ask you a while ago where you listen to the show. And um, Spirit of Mongan, thank you very much for pointing out that you are listening to us on your Google speaker in your nightly bath. Very important that it's nightly. This time of year, you do have to move into a more frequent personal <laughs> hygiene regime. So nightly bath is well pointed out. And um, I hope we continue to please you. Very kind words. Anybody else listening in their bath? I was going to say splash together, but this isn't radio. <laughs> there will just be random people splashing around. At, at different bath. times. That's right. I listen to us when I'm in the shower. Because I, know, I know you're a, you're a, you're a ablutions listener, aren't you? I am, I am. And the reason for that is when I had the bathroom done, I, I didn't even know they existed. I put in one of those... Um, uh, like uh, bathroom cabinets with built-in speakers. Oh, I've never heard and of those. It's really it's all Bluetooth, and so I listen to us when um, w- when I'm in there, just to sort of hear it back and whatever. And normally, see, I live in like a Victorian terrace, and there's a new bit on the back where our bathroom is, and that's where the wall is thinnest. And we've got new next door neighbours. We haven't had next door neighbours for ages, and they've got a young kid. And as I came out of the bath, this uh, the shower this morning, I should say, I didn't have us on, but I had quite a gruesome recounting of somebody escaping uh, a werewolf being <laughs> uh, like scratching down their back and about to go for their jugular. And I thought, mm, I wonder if this shouldn't be so loud with a six year old <laughs> listening. And I thought, hang on, I'm scared <laughs> and I'm 48. I was wondering if your neighbours go, he's in the shower again talking to that man. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, because it's your voice, right? When you're listening to us. He always has a friend over for a shower. He always has a friend over for a shower. (laughs) (laughs) They talk about the weirdest stuff. (laughs) Oh, I'm going to keep that going. (laughs) I guess I haven't been able to shower for a week. He's on holiday. (laughs) Oh, I don't know if I could continue after that. I've got a tear in my eye. That's really funny. You will be the top talk of your street <laughs> do you know and that had not occurred to me at all <laughs> if i ever come round to a barbecue at your place and the neighbors are there and i introduce myself i'll have this weird look of recognition <laughs> he's the one he's the one who's always in the shower with pen just hang a radox out of your back pocket <laughs> oh, that's so funny <laughs> oh how do i segue from that there is no way is there the, the, the parable podcast for the clean, <laughs> yeah. the dirty, and everyone <laughs> vigorously toweling down. Yes. <laughs> well, all right, I'm just going to go for the episode because I really cannot segue. Um, and this episode, Ben, was... Uh, the idea of it came partly from the episode that you put together last week, the one on blood and vampires, which mm. was absolutely fascinating. If you're not listening to it out there, go back. It was a really good episode. Um, But during and since then, during the episode itself and afterwards, I've been thinking about vampire tropes and where they come from. And the second thing that influenced this episode is something I mentioned a few weeks ago after listening to a radio show. Do you remember I said there was the, uh, it was James O'Brien's Mystery Hour, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they were talking about where does that cliched image of a ghost in a white sheet come from? Oh, yes, yes. And and I never got the answer. I'm going to come on to that later, but let's start with the vampires, because that's obviously what we were talking about last week. And vampire tropes. Now, we talked a little bit last week about what influenced the lore and tropes of the vampire. Yeah, we had this debate about what came from Bram Stoker's novel and what was his existing law about vampiric creatures, Mm. let's say. And it really had played on my mind this week. So I thought I'd dig a bit deeper. We don't normally do kind of follow-on bits from episodes, but I really, it's been sitting with me. And it led me to a really interesting piece on a a website called nosweatshakespeare.com. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's a really good site. Definitely worth checking out. Now, obviously, its main focus is Shakespeare, as you would expect. There's a clue in the title. I was going to say, it's a funny spelling of all things vampires. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Um, but they do explore some of the other classics in British literature. And I came across an article on Bram Stoker's Dracula. And the piece says, Although Bram Stoker did not invent the vampire mythology, it is his novel that more or less defined it, setting down the rules about the nature of the undead. With his own inventions, such as vampire's fear of crucifixes, of garlic, of running water, that they have no reflection in mirrors, that they can turn into a bat, and that its blood-sucking will turn victims into vampires, and several other rules. So according to that website, those tropes, let's say, or they've become tropes, were originally created by Bram Stoker. Interesting, yeah. Yeah, because he needs some of those for the story, otherwise he can't he can't infect anyone else and yep. he can't be defeated, really. Yeah. Uh, the running water one has always struck me as odd. Yeah, that struck me as odd. Um, he's not having a bath. He's not having a bath, no. <laughs> yeah, don't, if you're a vampire, you're not listening to us in the bath. Now, I can see where Bram Stoker may have got some of them from these inventions, I mean, crucifixes, walding off evil makes sense, right? That's a no-brainer. Right, yeah. Turning into a bat, obviously vampiric bats exist in real life. I mean, they don't necessarily chomp on human necks, but they're there, right? Mm. Garlic is the one that always sticks out for me. Now, I did think, is this because garlic has been used for medical purposes for thousands of years? Mm. And in fact, around 460 BC, the Greek physician Hippocrates, who is known as the father of modern medicine, prescribed garlic to his patients for a number of illnesses. So that was way back in 460 BC. But it's supposed to be good for your blood. Yes. I thought, well, maybe the medical properties of garlic influenced Bram Stoker to include it in the novel. Mm. I was curious as to whether this now cliché that garlic wards off a vampire could have different origins, or at least ones that may have influenced Bram Stoker outside of the medical implications. Now, Ben, it never fails to amaze me where researching this podcast can lead you. (laughs) (laughs) And it led me to an interesting piece. Now, this is no joke. At the Toronto Garlic Festival website. <laughs> <laughs> oh, big shout out to those guys. That yeah. actually sounds like fun. I'd I, quite I, like you know what? Go. I saw some pictures of it. It looks amazing. Oh, oh, man. There's lots of cooking going on, obviously all using garlic. There's people with kind of, you know, these huge garlic, I don't know what they're called in multiple. <laughs> you look like you were miming a lute. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, well, there's lute playing. Gar- okay. <laughs> there's lutes made out of garlic husks. It's, it's superb. But the, the, um, on their website, they had a section called Why Do Vampires Hate Garlic? I thought this is good. Now, the Toronto Garlic Festival say, a persistent belief is the power of garlic to ward off vampires. Probably the most popular theory of the origin of the vampire and garlic is the disease porphyria. Have you heard of porphyria? No. It sounds like it m- might have something to do with iron deficiency. You're pretty good with that, actually. I actually I, I'll come on to that. You, your, your psychic abilities are in power in it's this. It's just, room. it's just the phi <coughs> bit in there. That's the symbol. Uh, give give of, it yeah. away. Yeah, of course. Now, porphyria is a term for several diseases, which are caused by irregularities in the production of hema, a chemical in the blood, according to the um, garlic website. Some form of the disease cause sufferers to be sensitive to light and leads to disfigurement of the skin, including erosion of the lips and gums. These factors could have led to the corpse-like fanged appearance that we associate with vampires and their dislike of sunlight. Interestingly, people who suffer from porphyria also have an intolerance to foods that have a high sulphur content, such as garlic. Oh, is that why it's so pungent then? Because it's full of I, I guess, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's interesting. So I thought that was interesting. So I decided I'd delve deeper into porphyria, and I porphyria, uh, and I started looking into medical journals and papers about it. And here's what I found. Some of this is is kind of what I've just been talking about, but it's a little more detail. So porphyria is a rare blood condition that affects the nervous system. 
It affects the production of hema, a key component of hemoglobin. Now, there are a lot of rather nasty symptoms that come with porphyria. One interesting one that connects to vampire tropes is this sensitivity to sunlight. Mm -hmm. Now, for some with the condition, exposure to sunlight can cause skin redness, changes in skin colour, and red urine. Ooh. Now, it's believed that the trope about vampires drinking blood may have come from the fact that the condition can result in red urine, leading some people to believe that the person suffering from porphyria has been drinking blood. Right, right. That totally makes sense. That would be terrifying. That would be terrifying. I mean, you know, there's that... I won't go too deep into the details, but you know that morning after you've had a big old beetroot salad... Mm. And for 13 seconds, you go, oh, my God. And then you're like, oh, no, I had beetroot. It's all all right. <laughs> we, we had it when uh, my daughter was, was a toddler. <laughs> and one day we noticed that she had blue poo. Mm-hmm. Oh, God. And we were really freaked out. And then we realised, no, she just eats a lot of blueberries. <laughs> oh, is that what it was? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Yeah, thankfully. Now, Professor Michael Hefferson of the Queen's University noted that as a treatment for for porphyria, some physicians had recommended that these patients drink blood to compensate for the defect in their red blood cells. Oh, he's not a proper doctor. Well, he was saying, it's not him, just to be clear, it's not him who's saying that. He's saying that historically some... Oh, I see. Yes, yes. He, he's the expert, good guy, knows what he's talking about. Okay, I was going to say, I don't think he should be anywhere near a medical chair. No, no, he just said some physicians did do this. Polish's doctor. Yes. Um, obviously, this was animal blood rather than human blood they were drinking. But I guess it may also have fed, if you pardon the pun, the vampire connection. Mm-hmm. In fact, generally, people who suffer from this condition need to lower their iron levels. Oh. So you were in the right ballpark, but it's actually, I think it's like an overproduction of iron. And again, some, uh, again, I'm no medical expert, but it, this doesn't sound good either. Sometimes blood drawing was carried out by physicians as well. Mm. <clears throat> I always think blood drawing cannot be a good thing in any shape or form, really. No, no. I mean, it was supposed to release your humours or something, wasn't it? I guess so. And then you had leeches and I guess in some conditions it does make sense to do it in rare conditions, but... Mm. So very rare. But yeah, don't do it, kids. Yeah. I mean, my medical knowledge is <laughs> it's pretty limited, so don't take my word for it. But I guess all of this connection with blood could add to this confusion and the law around vampires. You know what I mean? You've got mm. the drinking of the blood... I think the sunlight's interesting. For people who have this rare condition, exposure to sunlight can cause blistering, burning and permanent skin damage. Okay, that sounds really vampiric. Well, the burning bit especially. Right? Yeah. There may also be a connection with porphyria and fangs and garlic. Repeated attacks can cause your gums to recede, resulting in a fang-like appearance. Oh, oh that's, that's really interesting. I never thought of that either. No. Okay, that's good. And, as I already mentioned, garlic's high sulphur content can be a trigger for an attack. Right, yeah, yeah. So, so far we've got peeing red, yeah. fangs appearing, yeah. uh, in, sensitivity to sunlight. Burning and, of the skin or blisters uh, and reacting to sunlight. Burning, yeah, yeah. And the garlic brings on an attack. Yeah. That sounds like a vampire. Sounds like a vampire, doesn't yeah. it? There are other diseases that may have helped drive some of the vampire tropes, including TB and rabies, which came mm-hmm. up in my research. And we talked about some of the themes in Bram Stoker's Dracula around the connection with sexual transmission of diseases like syphilis and Francis Ford Coppola's 1992 movie adaptation, which many draw connections with HIV. Mm. Um, I guess all in all, Ben, it seems that the vampire legend and tropes could have been heavily influenced by all kinds of diseases, but I I think the porphyria is really interesting. That is really interesting. And I suppose as well, 
it's sort of the, the when you put it that way, it's something to be fearful of as well because it will probably kill you. Yes. So, so that also sort of feeds into the oh, you know that that's why they're so evil. Yeah. Well, it was also I think the other thing that feeds in. It's a very, as far as I understand it, it's a quite a rare disease. So, you know, again, in less enlightened times it would be rare to come across someone who has it. But if you did, you can imagine how the kind of, you know, paranoia, legend and law started, started, right? Yeah, they're going to look quite unusual. Yeah, yeah, there's a strange appearance, there's the kind of blood thing, there's the, you know, not being able to go out in the sunlight, you know. Not being able to go to Prezzo. Yeah, I mean, I guess back then as well, nobody knew what that was, probably for the well, person. Prezzo. No, yeah, the Prezzo, <laughs> that is true. <laughs> Double garlic bread, no. Um, but no, I guess that even the person who is, was suffering from that... Um, condition yeah in in the olden days wouldn't, wouldn't have a clue what was going on to them they no. may even believe something you know strange super supernatural was happening to them yeah i'm sure they did yeah i'm sure it would have been frightening and sadly it's probably very easily cured these days yeah i'm not sure i didn't i didn't research the cure um probably should have looked into that bit <laughs> i was just amazed that it exists i'd never heard of it before yeah i'm gonna research the cure as well i love friday i'm in love yeah there you go sorry i mean one of those moves that <laughs> that's all right happened to me. <laughs> you keep them coming one of them will land <laughs> <laughs> oh sorry <laughs> couldn't resist it <laughs> um, let's move on to the cliche of a ghost being a white sheet with two holes cut out for eyes. Yeah, this has been something that we've been talking about. We even got James involved. We did, yes. And he kind of led us in the right direction. Mm. Um, and I've, he, he set, us, set me off a little bit on this journey of where to look. Um, so we all know that image, right? It's the go-to look for kids, uh, a fancy dress party or a Halloween ghost, right? And probably until the 2017 movie, A Ghost Story, I always associate it being portrayed in films as a kind of comic trope, right? Comical trope. It is, yeah. Or a kiddie thing, you know, a Scooby-Doo, Casper. Casper, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But where does this striking image originate? Well, in order to understand how the image of a ghost in a sheet gained traction, we need to understand the centuries-old practice of dressing the dead in shrouds. Mm, okay, that makes sense. So this is this this is what James said when we phoned him. He said, "Oh, it's to do with shrouds." I mm, think mm. this is a practice dressing people in shrouds that transcends many cultures and continents. Native Americans would wrap the bodies of the dead in hides and place them on a burial platform platform with their prized possessions. This is interesting for a completely different part of the world. There are similar rituals practiced by Aboriginal Australians. Oh. Pretty much identical from what I saw in my research. You know, covered in skin with your possessions, put on a kind of a kind of plinth or whatever. Um, when the Spanish arrived in Peru in the 16th century, they noted that the Chacapoya people would wrap their dead in woven cloth shrouds, place them on a cliff as if they were waiting for something from the sky to take them. Ooh. I've seen photos of this. This is not just like stick them on, you know, the top of a cliff, like on the White Cliffs of Dover. They would climb up with these kind of bodies wrapped in shrouds and almost they look a bit like, uh, you know, the faces of Easter Island. They're a bit mum yeah. cross between that and mummified. So I think the shrouds would go first. But people used to take them to really inaccessible parts of the cliff so nothing could disturb them and just leave them up there with the idea that they would be their souls would be taken into the sky it's an amazing tradition it's kind of it's quite romantic yeah there is something really romantic it's, it's a bit ufo-y as well i thought it is yeah yeah um the egyptians would wrap the dead in linen cloth as part of the mummification process it's thought that this dates back as far as 2000 bc Gosh. And there are examples of rituals of bodies being buried or cremated involving cloth shrouds in Islam, Judeo-Christian, Buddhist religions and paganism. So it's kind of ubiquitous across the continent and across religions and beliefs. 
And, of course, whenever you say shroud, the Shroud of Turin is what I think of. Yeah, because that's left lifted the level of the of the shroud in kind of popular culture and was a mystery for a long time right it was but but here's here's the weird thing is so when we talk about ghosts now most of the accounts that you hear in contemporary times are well they're they're either they're full body apparitions wearing what they used to wear yeah um, or they're sort of dark shadow shadow people, whether they're ghosts or not is an, is another matter. But I I don't really come across generally people going, oh, I saw this thing and it was had its arms in the air and yeah, it was yeah. floating with a sheet on. Once again, we, we're doing this a lot to each other at the moment. You are you'd almost see my notes further on. Oh. <laughs> You're onto something. Oh, okay. But I will come back to that. Um, so let's focus on some British ghost stories involving shrouds, um, or what we might term as the white-sheeted ghost. I'll come on to some stories in a minute. But as I said earlier, it always amazes me the strange places, such as garlic websites, researching the podcast can take you. And this is no exception. I found some interesting stuff about burial shrouds on the official UK Parliament website. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, believe it or not. I, I believe you. On a section titled Burying the Dead. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I would have expected, well, I suppose there's laws around it, yeah. Well, exactly. So this uh, the, on the website it says, in 1666 and again in 1679, Parliament ordered that all bodies should be buried in a shroud of woollen cloth. Though chiefly intended to stimulate the english woolen industry (laughs) (laughs) so we were burying him in woolen cloth before then but we passed a law that they had to be buried in woolen cloth the measure remained on the statute books until it was repelled in 1814 that's such a weird way of stimulating the woolen industry it is such a weird way isn't it but i guess you know it's a bit like haircuts it's a constant market it's never going to change is it no (laughs) no i suppose not no god imagine the insurance you take out now, they'd be advertising it on telly. Yeah. You know, it would be included with your funeral insurance, including giant sock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it just amazes me. Not only did Parliament put in place a law that you had to be buried in a shroud, they even dictated what the shroud needed to be made of, wool. I was wondering, Ben, <laughs> if you were taken to court and broke the law, would you need a bah, rister? <laughs> oh, my God, that's really good. I wish I'd thought of that. Yeah, you probably would. <laughs> um, should we get on to some spooky tales, real, apparently real tales involving ghosts and shrouds? Yeah. As you pointed out, these go back a little way. They're not modern ones. These, these, these are taking us back. I'm going to start with one that I found uh, that makes reference to that parliamentary law I just referred to. <laughs> in the story, which is interesting. It was published on the 7th of February, 1891, in the Religio Religio Philosophical Journal, and it refers to an investigator named Andrew Lang. Oh. I'd not heard of him, but apparently he was an investigator and writer. It says, The most impressive spectre he, Andrew Lang, had ever heard of, he says, in substance, appeared in an English village. Half a dozen children who had been playing together in a house rushed out through the open door in a frightened state of mind and one of them fell down in a fit. A lady who was driving through the village stopped, attended to the child who was lying on the ground before the horses and asked the other children as to the cause of the panic. They said they had been playing on the staircase when a dreadful woman suddenly appeared among them. The only reason they could give for saying that the woman was dreadful was that she wore a long woolen robe and her brow and chin were bound up with white linen. In fact, says the writer, she was a walking corpse come back from the days when the law compelled us to be buried in woolen for the better encouragement of the wool trade. The wandering old death seen in the sunlight by the children has always appealed to me as a very good example of ghosts and their vague and unaccountable ways, 
for it is most unlikely that the children knew anything of the obsolete law of the ancient English mortuary fashion. No, I imagine they didn't. Which is interesting, right? Yeah, and it sort of implies that there's a rotten face there, the brown... Yeah. Oh, that's terrifying. Yeah, yeah, scary, huh? Yeah. But that, that connection with the woolen burial shroud, I thought was really interesting. For As I he said, so. kids wouldn't know about that. No, no, I'm oh, surprised. Well, wouldn't uh, unlikely to know about it, maybe. Yeah, so. I'm surprised <laughs> that it retained its integrity. Yeah, yeah. Well, the next story was chronicled by William Henry Harrison in his book Spirits Before Our Eyes from 1879. I will relate a double dream that occurred to two ladies, a mother and daughter, the latter of whom related it to me. They were sleeping in the same bed at Cheltenham when the mother, Mrs C, dreamt that her brother-in-law, then in Ireland, had sent for her, that she entered his room and saw him in bed apparently dying. He requested her to kiss him, but owing to his livid appearance, she shrank from doing so and awoke with horror upon the scene upon her. The daughter awoke at the same moment, saying... I've just had such a frightful dream. Oh, so have I, returned the mother. I've been dreaming of my brother-in-law. My dream was about him too, replied the daughter. I thought I was sitting in the drawing room and that he came in wearing a shroud, trimmed with black ribbon, and approaching me, he said, My dear niece, your mother has refused to kiss me, but I'm sure you will not be so unkind. Does sound like a bit of a perv, this ghost. I was it? going to say, that's a bit weird. <clears throat> yeah. Goes for the mother first. <laughs> no tongues. No. I haven't no. got one. No. Uh, it goes on. As these ladies were not in the habit of regular correspondence with their relatives, they knew that the earliest intelligence likely to reach them, if he were actually dead, would be by means of the Irish papers, and they waited anxiously for the following Wednesday, which was the day these journals were received in Cheltenham. When the morning arrived, Mrs C hastened at an early hour to the reading room, and there she learnt what the dreams had led them to expect. Their friend was dead, and they afterwards ascertained that his decease had taken place on that night. They moreover observed that neither one nor the other of them had been speaking or thinking of this gentleman for some time previously to the occurrence of the dreams, nor had they any reason whatsoever to feel uneasiness with regard to him. It is remarkably peculiar in this case that the dream of the daughter appears to be a continuation of that of the mother. In the one he is seen alive, in the other the shroud and black ribbons seem to indicate that he is dead and complains of the refusal to give him a farewell kiss. (laughs) One is almost inevitably led here to the conclusion that the thoughts and wishes of the dying man were influencing the sleepers or that the released spirit was hovering near them. Waiting for one <laughs> last, last kiss. Nod. Yeah. <laughs> I might be dead, but I'm still hot, aren't I? <laughs> yeah. Well, not according to the mother. Well, it definitely sounds like that's a familiar thing, the dead coming back to say goodbye. Yeah. I think the two standout things are the, the shroud and the inappropriateness. <laughs> well, at, I, I do like that idea of the dreams continuing in a linear fashion yeah yeah that that intrigues me that idea that two people having their own dream but you know one is a continuation of the other one's fascinating that is fascinating i mean that one does sound it does sound like there might be a paranormal explanation for it yeah because i've i've had dreams about people that have passed and usually it's doing something mundane and um they're alive and well in the dream um and so nothing spooky that's just my head making that up yeah 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 yeah. Yeah. well here's another story that took place on the isle of Wight and was published in the london freemason magazine on the 1st of june 1796 
under the title. I love the titles back then. They really didn't know how to do kind of clickbait, did they? The title is A Recent Remarkable Circumstance Which Occurred in the Isle of Wight. <laughs> <laughs> you won't believe number eight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the piece says, In the month of September last year, the body of a young woman dressed in black silk with a watch, a ring and a small sum of money was found floating near Spithead by the lieutenant of the Impress and conveyed to ride in the Isle of Wight. As no person owned it, a parish officer, who was also an undertaker, took it upon himself to enter it. I think that's like claim it, right? Yeah, I think so. For the property that was attached to it, which was accordingly performed. One evening, about a fortnight after the event, a poor man and woman were seen to come into the village and on application to the undertaker for a view of the property which belonged to the unfortunate drowned person. They declared it to have been their daughter, who was overset in a boat as she was going to Spithead to see her husband. They also wished to pay whatever expense the undertaker had been at and to receive the trinkets which had so lately been the property of one so dear to them. But this the undertaker would by no means consent to. So basically, it sounds like the undertaker claimed the body and the property, and now the relatives turn up saying, you know, that's our daughter, we want her stuff. And he said, no, I'm not giving it to you. That's um, is that legal? I think as long as, long as she's wearing wool, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Do whatever you like. Did they kiss her though? <laughs> no, they didn't kiss oh, her. Okay, good. They repaired the, therefore to the churchyard, where the woman, having prostrated herself in the grave of the deceased, consin- continued some time in silent meditation or prayer, then crying "Philillu" after the manner of the Irish at funerals. So sorrowfully departed with her husband. The curiosity of the inhabitants of Ride, excited by the first appearance and behaviour of this couple, was changed into wonder when returning in less than three weeks they accused the undertaker of having buried their daughter without a shroud. Ah. Saying she had appeared to them in a dream, complaining of the mercenary and sacrilegious undertaker and lamenting the indignity which would not let her spirit rest. The undertaker stoutly denied the charge, but the woman, having secretly purchased a shroud, there's a lot of detail here, trying it on herself, at upper ride, was watched by the cellar and followed about 12 o'clock at night into the churchyard. After lying a short time on the grave, she began to remove the mould with her hands, and incredible as it may seem, by two o'clock had uncovered the coffin which, with much difficulty and the assistance of her husband, was lifted out of the grave. On opening it, the stench was almost intolerable and stopped the operation for some time, but after taking a pinch of snuff, she gently raised the head of the deceased, taking from the back of it and the bottom of the coffin not a shroud, but a dirty piece of flannel with part of the ha- the hair sticking to it, of which the writer of this account saw lying on the hedge so lately as last month. I love the wording. On the hedge? Yeah. Clothing, the body with the shroud, everything was carefully replaced, so they, 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 they didn't put the proper shroud on the body. And on second application, the undertaker, overwhelmed with shame, restored the property. The woman, whose fingers were actually worn to the bone with the operation, retired with her husband and has never been heard of since. Maybe she'll come on the show. Yeah. That's a really disturbing tale, though. Yeah, there's so much disturbing about it. Yeah, yeah there really is. But, you know, it sounds... Again, I think this... Uh, what I like, what's interesting about it, even when I was reading it, it's like it is written in a news report. It's not like a... Uh, no you know what I mean it's not like a fictional piece it's yeah yeah the, the detail you wouldn't write it that way would you as a ghost story no of course not no you, you know and I was really interested in the fact that because they travelled a long way and then come back three weeks later after having this nightmarish dream that their daughter visited them and said I wasn't buried properly in a shroud I wonder I wonder whether she was worried about the legal side of it or a spiritual Side, like genuinely, yeah. she, why was the spirit that worried? Yeah, 
Yeah. I think it's... it's oh, the implication in the article is that she couldn't pass on unless she'd been buried properly. Right, right. You know, I guess, again, like buried in a sacred site or whatever. It's, you know, I guess it's, yeah. it's, it's the kind of root of a lot of ghost stories, isn't it? I'm thinking of Poltergeist and the the uh, Native American burial ground and moving the bodies and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, apart from the spooky nature of the story, it highlights, I guess, culturally, how important burying someone in a shroud was in those days. Mm. The next encounter, the last story I'm going to do, um, is chilling. It has, it's interesting because it hasn't really got a payoff to it, but the detail's quite scary. It was published... There's some weird publications back in the day. It was published in The Schoolmaster, an Edinburgh Weekly magazine. Speaking of niche. Yeah. Published in 1832. The story takes place a month after Mrs A, not giving a full name, or they're not, had seen the doppelganger of her husband. Mm. We like a doppelganger on this show. Really love a doppelganger. After a month after this occurrence, the appearance of her husband's doppelganger, Mrs A, who had taken a somewhat fatiguing drive during the day, was preparing to go to bed about 11 o'clock at night and sitting before the dressing glass was occupied in arranging her hair. I love the fact they didn't call them mirrors in those days. Dressing glass, I like. I like dressing bar. She was in a listless and drowsy state of mind, but fully awake, when her fingers were in the active motion among the papillots. I, I think they're papers that you used to put little kind of things in your hair, like butterflies in your hair. Oh, yeah, yeah. Curls, butterfly curls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, she was suddenly startled by seeing in the mirror the figure of a near relation, who was then in Scotland and in perfect health. The apparition appeared over her shoulder, and its eyes met hers in the glass. It was enveloped in grave clothes, closely pinned, as is usual with corpses, round the head and under the chin, and though the eyes were open, the features were solemn and rigid. The dress was evidently a shroud, and Mrs A remarks, even the punctured pattern usually worked in a peculiar manner round the edges of the garment. Mrs A described herself at the time sensible of a feeling like what we conceive of fascination, compelling her for a time to gaze at this melancholy apparition, which was as distinct and vivid as any reflected reality could be. The light of the candles upon the dressing table appearing to shine full upon its face. After a few minutes, she turned around to look for the reality of the form over her shoulder, but it was not visible, and it also disappeared from the glass when she looked again in that direction. On the 26th of the same month, about 2pm, Mrs A was sitting in a chair by the window in the same room with her husband. He heard her exclaim, What have I seen? And then looking at her, he observed a strange expression in her eyes and countenance. A carriage and four had appeared to her to be driving up the entrance road to the house. As it approached, she felt inclined to go upstairs to prepare to receive company, but as if spellbound, she was unable to move or speak. The carriage approached, and as it arrived within a few yards of the window, she saw the figures of the postilions and the persons inside take the ghastly appearance of skeletons and other hideous figures. The whole then vanished entirely when she uttered the above mentioned exclamation. Ooh. So, as I said, there's no conclusion. It doesn't really tie it to her relative up in Scotland that I could find. But there were some big visions going on there, right? Yeah, really. Like, there's, yeah. There's an awful lot of um, spectral influence. Yeah, but again, the apparition of this figure in a burial shroud. Mm, mm. And you kind of alluded to a bit earlier, digging into these stories really got me thinking. They all describe a shroud, one that to some degree covers the face, hence the trope of a ghost in a white sheet with the eyes. You know, it's a kind of adaptation of that. Now, I'm sure there are modern-day ghost encounters involving shrouds like that, but... I've never really come across one, have you? No, never, no. And that raises a number of questions, right? <laughs> the big one being, why don't we see them now? D- 
did the full shrouded ghost possibly morph maybe influenced by victorian ghost stories into that other ghostly trope the figure of the lady in the white dress yes so when we stopped burying people in shrouds which was kind of around the 1800s that's when the law was repealed did that kind of change into the woman in the white dress so that got me thinking Unless ghosts have time-limited existence, right? (laughs) I.e. shrouded ghosts have all passed on now, so Mm. that you don't see them. Or there is a ghost equivalent of the fashion police. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. (laughs) Oh, darling, shrouds are so last season. (laughs) You know what I mean? To me, it leaves two likely explanations. The skeptics was the skeptics would say it proves that ghost sightings are a psychological phenomena of hallucination. Yes, that we can only comprehend through our own cultural reference point. The clothing changes as our knowledge and reference points change. Right from yeah shrouded to kind of woman in white, like you said. You know, I was thinking of that um, really scary ghost in the is it the haunting of Hill House who's kind of in an old suit and I think he's got like a bowler hat and a cane, and but he floats rather than walks, really scary. Um, but yeah, does, does it, if it's psychological, our reference point would change, right? Right. we wouldn't see them in burial shrouds because we don't bury people in burial shrouds anymore. No. Now, the believer would say that these stories confirm or prove that ghosts are spirits of the dead, whether full shrouded or misinterpreted as the woman in white, they are wearing the clothing of the dead, right? So if you're a believer, that's what you're going to say. So whether sceptical or believer, both positions seem to agree we're talking about the dead, either fulfilling a psychological need to understand or grieve death ourselves from a sceptic point of view, or a true visitation from a spirit of the actual dead if you're a believer, right? That's kind of where you're kind of left thinking. Yeah, exactly. Now, you need to bear with me on this next bit. (laughs) Sometimes on the podcast, we do go off at a kind of weird tangent, but I'll be interested to see what you think. I went off at a weird tangent. I started to wonder if there was a third way, Ben. Third way. Is this your own theory or is this another? It's kind of my own theory. Now, it's one I've only really put together in the last couple of days, and you might go... It's absolutely crazy, but it's it's worth a consideration. And let me tell you how I got to this theory. I w- I've been reading over time this interesting book by Stephen Sloman and Philip Fernback called The Knowledge Illusion. I don't know if you've heard of this. It's, no, no. It isn't a book about the paranormal. It's about human behaviour, but it did set me off on this third way of thinking about these ghostly tropes. One of the authors says, We think we know a lot more than we actually do. Sloman argues that most of us know very little about how everyday things work, what sparked events in history and how influential people have shaped the world. Indeed, we succeed in life because understanding is stored in a community of knowledge. Mm -hmm. That is that because other people know things, we don't need to know everything and we just assume that we do. Mm, mm, that makes a lot of sense. Sloman goes on to say, I think step one is to admit our lack of knowledge and to re- reduce our hubris. To accept the fact that we don't know everything and to accomplish things, we have to make use of people around us. I think this concept of stored community of knowledge is interesting. And I started thinking it's really interesting, especially if that stored knowledge is wrong. We've kind of touched on this recently in some of those um, scientific reports. Yeah, because it's um, like mass, like, um, uh, what's the word I'm groping for? But it's, um, if you if you believe something that's wrong and other people do as well, your belief is affirmed. Yeah, exactly. If you need examples of this kind of how the stored knowledge can be wrong, I was thinking, you know, like you've got Galileo and Leonardo da Vinci they challenged the perceived wisdom that the sun orbited the earth, right? Right, yeah. But this this happens even in kind of more modern times. Even in the 20th century, you can see this in action. Um, If you take, there's a 
a guy called Alfred Wegener who developed the theory of continental, continental drift. You know, that the continents were at one time connected but slowly drifted apart yeah, through shifting yeah. plates. Pangaea. Yep. The theory was rejected and often ridiculed by his fellow scientists during his lifetime, but post his death was proven to be true. So this is in the 20th century. People were going, no, that's a ridiculous idea. And I, I'm pretty sure I heard uh, a story about him presenting it at a scientific conference and people were laughing. Blimey. Uh, yeah. Now, have they not been to Iceland? I mean, you can see it. <clears throat> yeah, well, it's, that was that, and that was also part of his point. I think he was connecting. I think he was saying, "Look, if you look at this part of uh, America and this part of Scotland, they do actually fit together." Yeah, but I think it was, and I, I'm sure some some scientists did agree with that, but they didn't see it coming from plates shifting. They thought it was due to other things, right? So all that was in my head right now i'm not claiming that what i'm going to say next is putting me in any way as the same company as those amazing visionaries i just cited could we just be clear about that right? <laughs> <laughs> you know galileo and da vinci and pisa from the quantum mechanic no <laughs> i mention all this because it highlighted to me one as humans we need to make sense of the world around us right we all agree that makes yeah yeah Two, there is a lot we assume we understand that we don't. Now, I'm sure there's a evolutionary value. Otherwise, we probably would be paralysed by our own ignorance, right, and fear. Mm. We wouldn't do anything if we didn't have some kind of instinct that we know things that we don't. Thirdly, when someone comes up with a different theory that challenges perceived wisdom, it's really hard for it to be even considered, let alone break through, right? Mm. Those examples of Galileo and the continental plates. Mm. So given all that, and relating to the fact we no longer see, or at least rarely see, ghosts in shrouds, so the sceptic will say, proves it's a psychological phenomenon or need. As we've said on the podcast many times, that probably can explain some or even most ghost encounters, but not all. And it does raise the question, Ben, why are so many people experiencing these hallucinations, right? Right, yeah. For the believer, the shroud ghosts would prove that ghosts are the manifestation of the dead. They're wearing the clothing. But again, as I said, why do we no longer see them that way? Um, the believer might say it doesn't matter that they've changed appearance, we are still seeing them, which means ghosts exist, right? Right. So I wondered if there is a third way in which both sceptics and believers are both wrong and in some ways both right. Maybe, just maybe, we are seeing something that is real, but because it is way beyond our comprehension and understanding, it causes a type of hallucination or creative interpretation in order for us to make sense of what we are seeing and experiencing. Yeah. I mean, we like, we've talked about it many times. It's Again, it's a bit of a trope, but ants trying to make sense of what the moon is. They're looking up at the moon. We know what, what the yeah. heck do they think that is? Mm -hmm. Or another example I was thinking about is that scene in The Lion King when they're looking up at the stars and wondering what they are, and Timon says, they're, fi they're fireflies that got stuck on that big bluish-black thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That would make sense, right? Yeah, if you it didn't would make know, sense. That's, that's not a bad explanation. Are ghost encounters and visions just us trying to make sense of something we don't understand? And the tropes we create help us do that or put them into a context that is easier for us to accept or rationalise. Yeah, yeah. That's my third way. No, I, I that makes a lot of sense. Um, that same th sort of thing applies to UFOs. Yes, oh, uh, my thoughts did go to owls. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we've talked about this before, that, you know, people seeing bright lights in the sky will go for the idea that it's a UFO, and possibly mm. it's not a UFO. Or even when we did the episode on um, infrasound that the infrasound creates a hallucination and because you're in a spooky place, you see a ghost or something spooky. Right, yeah. But I wonder, if you go with this third-way theory and you apply it to UFOs, if you saw an alien creature, 
rather than it necessarily being a screen memory, maybe you go, I need to process that as an owl because I can't deal with it's the fact too much. it's something. Yeah. yeah, it's too much. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Um, there's that old saying that when the ships first arrived in, I don't know whether they say America or whatever, but um, the the locals couldn't see them because they couldn't process ships. Well, I think that's been debunked. It's more likely they didn't know that they were a threat or how to describe them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we had similar conversations about the airships, didn't we, with um, yeah, with Nigel Watson and just people interpreting them. UFOs were airships. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah. Kind of steampunk. They're always about 20 years ahead of what we know. Yeah, which, again, m- could fit into this theory. We are not seeing UFOs necessarily. We are seeing some other phenomenon and we process it. You know, we, we will accept it's extraordinary but we will frame it in a level which is just ahead of what we have now because to, you know, to see a Tic Tac UFO in the 19th century, you couldn't fathom it, you know what I mean? But when you've had balloons and stuff, then making it a, a almost technologically advanced version of what you understand could help you process what you're seeing. And what yeah. you're seeing may be nothing to do with aliens or ufos or you know even something flying in the sky it just might be an an anomaly that you can't process yes and and as i've said before i do think the ufo phenomena and ghosts and everything i do think there's a connection somewhere Mm. well if we go back to the ants and the moon you know, well, I guess two things struck me, and I guess that's why I was getting up with Galileo and the other examples, is you almost, as humans, you almost go for a feeling that, well, we know everything now. <laughs> Do you know? Yeah. There's there's nothing completely undiscovered. And, and there's not, it's a bit more nuanced than that. But I think there is an inherent thing to say, well, that was history. Of course, they didn't understand, but we understand now. Um, but you know why wouldn't there be so a there is going to be stuff that we haven't even considered or understand understood like you know radiation back in the day who understood what that was about right until we understood yeah yeah um but also i think ants looking at the moon there could be all kinds of stuff out there that's you know i don't know this it's just off the top of my head but you know, I, I, I tell you what it's making me think of. There's that lovely bit of Men in Black at the end where they, I think they pan out from the Earth and the you know, the galaxy and the universe and and then the more they pan out, you see it's an alien playing marbles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 I remember that one. Yeah, but in that scenario, it's like there there could be things up there we just can't, that's going on around us that we just can't even perceive. Maybe it's interdimensional, maybe it's something else. Every now and again, we get a glimpse of it and we just don't know how to deal with it. So we've had to invent ghosts. We've had to invent UFOs. We've had to invent the dead coming back, let alone all the cultural stuff and religious stuff and other things that influenced it. Maybe it stems from the fact that every now and again, we get a glimpse of this, like an ant looking at the moon, this thing we can't understand. And particularly if we're not built to understand it. Mm. Like yeah. we're built that I can see that um, uh, that bookcase is a bookcase. I couldn't remember the word for it then. It's a bookcase, <laughs> but it isn't really. It's a. It's actually a waveform. Yeah, yeah. But so w- whatever these things are, maybe it just makes our brains fall over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, you might have solved ghosts again. I, don't, I think I think I've unsolved ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you keep solving them and then unsolving them. Yeah. But no, it does that that probably explains more about the shroud mystery than I would have got from literally every episode of Scooby Doo. <laughs> well, I think Scooby Doo is a good example because I was really drawn to that idea that okay, if shrouds are not seen now. You know, like I said, unless there is some law that after a hundred years, you know, they've moved, all ghosts have moved on, which doesn't really sit with, 
you know, ghost lore and legend. Um, you know, why are we still seeing Dick Turpin now? You know what I mean? Mm, mm. Um, so unless they have a kind of, there's a ghost shelf life, why are we not seeing shrouded ghosts? It doesn't make any sense. So you start to think it must be psychological, but that then I start thinking, well, if even if it is psychological, that doesn't mean it's not paranormal. It's just not paranormal in the way we think it is. Yeah. That is very... I like that. I like that a lot. Because it comes back to this fact that if it was purely a psychological hallucination for making us cope with death or 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 grieving a lot of people are having that hallucination and a lot of people are having it when they're not grieving so i i, I don't get i get you know and i totally will admit that there must be a lot of examples maybe the majority of them that are connected in that way to to grief and uh, the grief process but there are a few that kind of step outside that, that you go, well, that doesn't make sense. And I'm always amazed when I talk to people about the podcast. Uh, we've talked about it before when people say, well, I don't believe in the paranormal. I don't believe in ghosts. But they've got a ghost story. <laughs> There's always that one time. Yeah. That is true. There which is which, which fits that third way theory, right? Yeah, it does, yeah. They're processing something that that doesn't make sense. Yes, yes. And they just refuse to assign it a category. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've heard that so many times. I don't believe in ghosts, but I've got a ghost story, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that's the journey from a garlic website to that. That is fantastic. Did you go via the Isle of Wight? I think that's known for its I w- garlic. I went for the, well, the Isle of Wight did feature. We had a, one of the stories, ghost stories, was from the Isle of Wight. Oh, was it? Sorry, I yeah, missed yeah. that bit. Yeah, yeah, no, it's from the an extraordinary event, circumstance at the Isle of Wight. Oh, right, yes, of course. Yeah. Yes. And we even went to the UK Parliament website as well. So yeah, we, we had, did. We had yeah. a bit of everything. Yeah, no, it was a bit of everything. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I wasn't expecting to go on that journey. That is the most interesting conversation we've had about pieces of wool ever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I do think it's a good, it's a good theory. It stands... Let's try it. Yeah, well, I wondered if we could... Because I, I wanted to open it up and kind of look at UFOs and uh, other tropes and phenomena and see how that could connect in. So that's maybe something we'll do. I just got... I was surprised how much there was about the shrouds and I got kind of got off on that tangent. But I think there's more to explore. I think the UFO angle on this would be interesting to delve a bit deeper. Definitely, definitely. Um and then there's the old uh, chestnut of is it a simulation? But let's not go there today. Yeah, I think it's funny when I when we do the podcast, every all bets are off in a simulation, aren't they? Yeah, because yeah. you can basically do anything. You know, you can do whatever you, you want. want to do, whatever you want, and everything kind of makes sense, whether it makes sense or it doesn't make sense, because it's just part of the simulation. So, um, yeah, no, that's that's interesting as well. Well, we'd love to know. Um, <laughs> whether you think we've just gone off on this weird strange tangent or what you think about ghosts uh whether they are the dead why well maybe that's the maybe that's the question i'm doing a massive question that's impossible to answer maybe you can <laughs> what t- are ghosts? yeah why don't you uh if you're listening out there and you uh look us up on social media at tqm podcast on facebook or twitter or on youtube at the quantum mechanics Tell us why we don't see ghosts in shrouds anymore. Yeah, I want to hear all the theories. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, Thank you for that. Is it time for us to go and have a shower now? Yeah, if you can, uh, if you just bang on the wall, let the neighbours know. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, well, you you can you can use it first, and I'll sit on the bath, and then we'll swap round. (laughs) Fair enough. All right. (laughs) Oh, that's an image that our listeners didn't want to have, really. I hope you have a great week and uh, we'll be back next week with more kind of, well, who knows where we're going to go on the quantum mechanics next week, but um, thanks for listening. I've got something about mice, but I'll tell you more about it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll see you next week. See you next week. Bye. Thank you, bye. Bye.
Are you the quantum mechanics?